This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Dear From the Pop Culture Bunker, I have a problem. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Way Free Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. One of the mainstays of the now collapsing newspaper business, and now becoming part of the online tumult, is the advice column. It's common for people to ask friends and family for their thoughts on personal issues. So why ask a perfect stranger, especially when it may take weeks or months to get a response, if ever? Advice columns are not really designed to get a one-on-one question answered, but for the community to listen in, consider the question, give their personal response, and even to argue with the column's response. The concept goes back much further than you might think, to 1691, in a column in a magazine called the Athenian Mercury. I didn't even know they had (laughs) magazines in 1691. People would send in questions ranging from political, is the Pope evil, to philosophical, what is time? But the topics slowly coalesced into the types of questions we would see today. The conceit was that you were asking questions to the Athenian society, something akin to Socrates or Plato, when it was actually just the publisher's drinking buddies. The success of this effort spurred many periodicals to copy the idea. Since most of the queries came from women and generally were tales of woe, Columns became known as Agony Ants in Britain and Sob Sisters in the U.S. It was col- common for the column writer to use a pseudonym, both to protect themselves and to allow publishers to swap out a new writer without changing the name. Dorothy Dix, a.k.a. Elizabeth Merriweather Gilmer, had a husband with a mental disorder so, she, so he could not keep a job, forcing her to get one, giving, ironically, mostly marital advice, starting in 1895. And by World War II, she was published in 273 newspapers with 60 million readers. Dorothy Dix's retirement in 1950 opened the door to a pair of identical twins who went on to lead the charge, Esther Pauline and Pauline Esther Friedman. I guess the parents didn't put much thought into that. Uh, Also known as Ann Landers and Dear Abby. They would eventually appear in over 1,600 newspapers and became the arbiters of what was considered normal in the U.S., They were also very conservative, which fit in well in 50s America. The husband's the breadwinner, and the wife is to be the homemaker. However, due to either changing society, guiding their own beliefs, or a need to follow them and stay in business, both Anne and Abby became more progressive over time. Abby supported gay rights in the early 70s, and Anne wrote about gun laws in the early 80s. In 1975, Ann Landers dropped the facade, announcing as herself that her marriage of 30 years had ended. Uh, the, she got back over 30,000 uh, condolence letters. The Ladies Home Journal was the home to a column called, Can This Marriage Be Saved? The brainchild of Paul Popno, a eugenicist and champion of marriage counseling, running from the 50s to the 70s. As you might expect, the column's answer was generally yes, and was a proponent of white marriages in particular. The woman was considered to be at fault in most cases, even in cases of domestic abuse. There is also what we would today call crowdsourced advice columns, where someone would post a query and other readers would eventually respond in kind. The Boston Globe's confidential chat ran in this manner from 1922 to 2006 and was called the biggest backyard fence in the world, It's really the earliest chat room. Mm -hmm. As newspapers began to fade in importance, the practice of the advice column moved over to electronic mediums. The internet has opened up the advice world to specialized columns can exist. Workplace advice, parenting advice, LGBTQ advice, sex advice, love advice, cooking advice, financial advice. There's a column for everyone out there. Some interesting phenomena of moving to the internet has been the relative speed of advice. As opposed to newspapers, questions can be answered in a much faster time frame, even in live Q&As. Sometimes letters are answered by more than one advice columnist, and it can happen in the same week. This happens so often that almost all advice columnists have at least one column explaining that, hey, these writers can submit the questions to as many people as they want... 
There's no rules. <laughs> and certainly if a letter is compelling enough question for Dear Prudence to answer, is it any surprise that Ask Polly might also answer? There's also the chance that someone is just copying other letters. In fact, for a while, the column Dear Debbie, penned by the late Debbie Reynolds in the tabloid The Globe, had numerous instances of answering letters that were just slightly altered from those that had previously appeared in Dear Prudence. And then there are the fake letters. Going back to newspaper days, Dear Abby answered a, clearly, a letter clearly based on Marge Simpson in the bowling episode. Now, many more fake letters make their way in, and some columnists even say they suspect a letter may be fake, but are answering it anyway because it is funny or universal. One last aspect of the Internet Advice column I'd like to mention is how reactions to some letters and replies are so immediate. From comment section remarks, Facebook postings, and media responses, columnists are often made to defend or change their replies, as did Dear Abby just this past week when she said that um, an Indian mother shouldn't give her name, her children Indian names because it would be too hard to pronounce in American society. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I read a lot of advice columns, and among my favorites are Slate's Dear Prudence, which has gone through four different scribes and is currently being penned by Daniel Mallory Ortberg, who is co-founder of the Toast website. Although my favorite Prudence was Emily Yaffe. Not only are there weekly comments, columns, but there's a live Q&A every week and a podcast. And many of the online yeah. columnists do this now. The tone of questions has changed with each change of prudence, and it's fascinating to watch the progression of the change. Ask Polly at the cut from New York Magazine writes long-form advice. Rather than tackling a few letters and problems each week, she addresses just one problem. This is interesting because in many other cases, letters are cut for time or space, and readers may never get the full picture. And some times you want more than just dump the guy advice. Polly gives a long, full, thought-out response. Heather Havlisky, the woman behind Ask Polly, has several books out, including a memoir and a compilation of Ask Polly columns. And then there are so many advice podcasts. You can search the iTunes store and you find everything from Dear Sugar to Advice from Mom. There's also the Judge John Hodgman podcast, which is essentially an advice show. Right, and, <laughs> and technically, My Brother, My Brother and Me is it's an awesome. advice show. Exactly. So there's comedy advice yeah. <laughs> as well as serious advice. So you can pick a subject and find an advice podcast. We would be happy to give you advice as well. You can write to us if you want. Or you can just check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. But come to think of it, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics could be an advice. Advice on, on what comics to read. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Who knew? From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. <laughs>